right, so this morning <clears throat> we're going to continue in Joshua. We ended in chapter 4 last week. <clears throat> and so today we're going to continue on. We'll be in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. And I titled today's message, The Consecration at Gilgal. The Consecration at Gilgal. All right, so as I... Um, just to back up just a little bit, chapter 3, we saw the children of, uh, of God, the nation of Israel, um, start entering into, or entering into the, the promised land. Actually, they are crossing the Jordan River. Um, last week in chapter 4, we saw them coming to, out of the river and into the promised land. So now we pick up um, in the events that take place once they make it on the other side of the river. Now they've set foot and are finally made it to the promised land, to the, to the land that was promised to them by God to Abraham and to his descendants. So before we get into chapter 5, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, uh, we are, we're thankful that you've given us another day. We're thankful that you've given us uh, the clouds that we've had for the past couple days, um, just the break from the heat, uh, and you're so good and so wonderful for giving that to, to us. Lord, I, I pray that we see it as a, as a blessing from you and that you know, we just enjoy it, enjoy the time that we, yeah, we have there with the clouds. Um, I pray that right now that you will bless uh, this morning's message, Lord. I pray that the, every word that we read um, from uh, your holy book will speak to the hearts and minds to those that are here, that it will speak to the hearts and minds to those watching this message uh, or hearing it later on, Lord. Uh, we know that you have the power and the strength to change lives. And your word will accomplish that, Lord. And so now we, again, we sit at your feet as we continue this time of worship to hear from you and again, just understand what you, what you want to tell us as a church and as individuals. Bless everyone here, Lord. Again, bless those that are watching. Uh, pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. And the Word of God says, When all the Amorite kings across the Jordan to the west and all the Canaanite kings near the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Jordan, before the Israelites, until they had crossed over, they lost heart, and their courage failed because of the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelite men again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelite men at Gebeath Her Haraloth. This is the reason Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness along the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out were circumcised, none of the people born in the wilderness along the way were circumcised after they had come out of Egypt. For the Israelites wandered in the wilderness 40 years until all the nation's men of war who came out of Egypt had died off because they did not obey the Lord. So the Lord vowed never to let them see the land He had sworn to their fathers to give, to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. He raised up their sons in their place. It was these Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised since they had not been circumcised along the way. After the entire nation had been circumcised, they stayed where they were in the camp until they recovered. 
The Lord then said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the disgrace of Egypt from you. Therefore, the place is still called Gilgal today. The very first verse of this chapter summarizes the effect that the miracle at the Jordan River had on the Canaanite nations. Upon realizing how powerful the God of Israel was, they lost heart and their courage failed. Now, logically, this would have been the best time to strike a paralyzing blow. Any military leader will tell you that the best time to strike is when the nation is scared of you, when they feel like they can't overcome you, when they feel like they're, when they're just scared that a more powerful God is with you. That's the best time to strike and to, you know, uh, to, blow, to strike a, mil- a paralyzing blow with an all-out military offensive. But here's the thing. Even though God's children, and this includes us as well, as well are quick to act, God isn't. See, he's never in a hurry. And so even though the idea of acting swiftly and decisively, it it made sense, it wasn't part of God's plan at that particular moment. See, from God's point of view, Israel wasn't ready to fight on Canaan soil. There was still some unfinished business, and it was spiritual in character. It was time for renewal. Consecration, you see, must precede conquest. Consecration must precede conquest. So before God could lead Israel to victory, He would lead them to, through four experiences. The renewal of circumcision, the celebration of the Passover, and uh, the appropriation of the land's produce. And lastly, the orientation of Joshua's leader. We'll be covering all the four of these in this chapter. Now, the first one, the renewal, of circumc- the renewal of circumcision, is seen in the first well, from verses 2 to 9. Now, I assume that everyone here knows what circumcision is and what it entails, um, what it's about. I won't get into the gory details about it, but if you don't, it's basically the removal of the male foreskin. Um, I won't go beyond that, but uh, that's what it was. But in the Bible, circumcision was an original sign of the covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And it was to be done to every male in every generation. Thus, it had special covenantal significance in Israel. However, it appears that this wasn't really done during Israel's time in the wilderness, during their wanderings in the wilderness. In fact, we're told in Exodus chapter 4 that Moses was actually almost killed by the Lord because he hadn't circumcised his own son. But even after that experience, again, this may have been because of God's grace, it seems that Moses hadn't been too concerned to encourage circumcision circumcision in the wilderness. If he had been, an entire generation, that entire generation that had just crossed the Jordan wouldn't have needed to be circumcised. Thus, the Lord directed 
Joshua to renew, renew the right of circumcision. And so without question or hesitation, Joshua did what he was told. He obeyed. He knew what it was about. He knew what it entailed. And I'm sure he wasn't looking forward to doing what he had to do. Verse 3 then says that Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelite men at Gebeth Haraloth, which means hill of the foreskins. Hill of the foreskins. In verses 4 through 7, it basically explained that since the new generation was now in their inheritance, it was important that they renew their covenantal or the covenant relationship with the Lord. See, if during their wilderness journey, Israel was tempted to sin, how much more would they be tempted now? They were living in the land, living in that land where all the Canaan, Canaanites lived. They would be surrounded by pagan people with immoral religious practices, and they'd be tempted to compromise with their enemies. Well, later, later on, we see that that's exactly what future generations did. They compromised because they forgot the true meaning, the true meaning of circumcision. What is the true meaning of circumcision? First, let's look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. It says this, Circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. The key there is circumcise your hearts. Over the years, the Jews came to trust that external mark of the covenant and not in the God of the covenant who wanted to make them into a holy people. See, they thought that as long as they were God's covenant people, they could just live as they pleased. Moses and the prophets warned them about this and there in Deuteronomy and in Jeremiah. When John the Baptist called them to repent, the Jewish spiritual leaders, what they say in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, we have Abraham as our father. What's unfortunate about their attitudes is that it's no different than many Christians today who feel sure that they're saved and they're going to heaven just because they're baptized they're confirmed and participate regularly in communion. In all reality, though, as good as these religious rites, as good as they can be, they must, they must never become substitutes for faith in Jesus. You see, no amount of external surgery can change the inner person. It's only by repenting and turning to God for help that he, can, that he can change our hearts and make us love and obey Him more. Circumcision of the heart. Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 20, 29 says this, Circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But you are a lawbreaker. Your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised, but who keeps the law, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. For a person is not a Jew, who is one outwardly. And true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. On the contrary, 
A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. Let me repeat that verse again. On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. The person's praise is not from people, but from God. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. God praises you for having an uncircumcised heart. Not because, you're circum- not because a person is physically circumcised. Again, he sees the heart. As I mentioned the past couple of weeks, born-again believers are justified by faith. Justification by faith precedes justification by works. Justification by works is working from salvation. So God justifies us and declares us righteous. See, church, God sees the beginning from the end. He sees it all. And because He knows the end from the beginning, God can declare us as He sees us in glory, even though we're still living on earth. And being sanctified and progressively becoming more and more like His Son. In other words, He sees us as we truly are, as He sees us in heaven, as He sees us in eternity. As a born-again believer, He sees you as righteous. He sees you as clean and forgiven, justified. He no longer sees you as a sinner. Psalm 103, 103 verses 10 through 12 says, God forgives our sins and casts them as far as the east is from the west. It's an expression there. And that expression, the east and west, essentially means that the, the phrase there means that they never meet. In other words, our sins are forgotten. Corey Ten Boom paraphrase, paraphrases these verses to say that God puts a no fishing allowed sign on the shore so that no one is allowed to pur- purchase the license to fish up on our sins, up our, uh, fish up our sins. In fact, cannot even fish up our own sins. Again, let me reiterate the importance of that. Our sins are gone. They're no more. Therefore, what does that mean? If they're gone, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Brother and sister in Christ, a fellow believer, saints of God, stop walking in condemnation. Stop walking in condemnation. You have a new identity. You're not that person that you once were that were just making a bunch of, you know, that sinner that you once were, that adulterer, that, you're not that murderer, you're not that liar. No. You are, you have a new identity. You are God's child. Guess what? You can never have that relationship nullified. It can never be abolished, canceled, or dissolved. That relationship must be intact from now even unto eternity. In trusting Jesus, we've been made, we've been to the place of removal, shame removal is what Jesus does. That's his specialty there, shame removal. Installment payments were made for sin all the way throughout the Old Testament. Every sacrifice made for sin 
was an installment on a debt we could never pay. That obligation was against us, keeping us from God. The good news is that Jesus went to the cross and he took the certificate of debt away. He erased it by nailing it to the cross. Jesus paid it all. And on the third day, the stone from Joseph's tomb was rolled away and Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Now, after all those men had been circumcised, they rested and recovered there at Gilgal. Lord then acknowledged the completed task by declaring, Today I have rolled away the disgrace of Egypt from you. Rolled away. That's what Gilgal means. I mentioned this last week a little bit, but that's what it means. Gilgal means rolled away. Now I think that the disgrace of Egypt refers to the ridicule the enemy the ridicule of the enemy when Israel failed to trust God at Kadesh Barnea and enter the promised land. But now, regardless of what the Egyptians and the other nations had said about Israel's sin there, and if you remember, that's where you know they set up the golden calf and all kinds of stuff happened. Tyre nation was almost destroyed. And Moses was like, no, you can't, you don't, don't do that. You can't do that. How is the world going to glorify you if you destroy your people? But again, regardless of what the nations and Egypt had said about Israel's sin there, that disgrace was now completely gone. It had been rolled away. So just as the disgrace of shame was rolled away at Gilgal, so the disgrace of sin is rolled away at Golgotha through the death of Christ, raised by the Spirit of God, that we may worship Him anew in heaven. As I mentioned before, Jesus is like the ark. He Briefly explain, in him there is manna, manna bread, and provision. In fact, Jesus is the bread of life. In the, ark is, in the Ark of the Covenant is Aaron's rod that budded. Aaron's rod represents the power of God, and Jesus is the power of God personified. In that Ark are two stabits of stone which represent the law of God, guess what? And Jesus is the Word of God. He is the living Word. And what did He do? Well, again, I mentioned it last week. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory of as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, church, He dwelt, tabernacled among us. And John also referred to this in Revelation chapter 21, 21 chapter, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and He will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So even, my friends, in eternity, he will be our ark. He will be our tabernacle. He will dwell in the midst of his people. So you see, we are bound for glory Friends, we're bound for glory. Church, 
other than you know the consecration that happened there at Gilgal, you also see that Gilgal was a place of rest. Have you been to Gilgal in this sense? The Israelites were tired. They had been walking around in the wilderness for 40 years. They had been mourning the death of Moses for 30 days. A million plus people had just crossed the Jordan River. Talking about old women, pregnant women, middle-aged men, all kinds of people, possibly disabled people as well, children, all of them crossing over, tired and exhausted. And then what? And the men had to be circumcised. So yeah, they needed rest. Likewise, some of us are really tired. Some of you are really tired. You're tired of all the trash that's out there, all, of, all the divisiveness, tired of being unemployed or employed at the wrong jobs, tired of making the hospital our second homes or the doctor's office our second residences. For me, I feel that way about the dentist's office. <laughs> We're tired. Like Fanny Lou Hammer of Mississippi would say, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Sick and tired. There's always, there, there always, or there seems to always be another surgery that is needed. We ask, why can't I be well? Live a normal life and enjoy what everyone else is enjoying. We're tired of relationships that have soured. We're tired of the distance in marriages where the dissonance between the two spouses, the husband and wife, is deafening. We're tired. Some are so tired that we wish at night not to wake up the next morning. Lord, take me home. I'm so tired of the sickness. I'm so tired of hurting. I'm so tired of my job, my career, my spouse, my children. The world, yes, the world. Well, church, Gilgal is a place of rest. And Jesus epitomizes and personifies that rest. Do you hear him saying what he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28? Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus is telling you that. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. According to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, the Old Testament Joshua didn't give the people of God rest. If he had, God wouldn't have spoken of another day when the people of God will have their Sabbath. Augustine said in his confessions, our souls are restless until they find their rests or their rest in thee. See, God has made a God-sized hole in us and nothing, nothing at all, nothing in this world, no person in this world will fill that hole except for God. Thus, only He can give us real rest. So the question I have for you is, have you been to Gilgal? When was the last time you were in Gilgal? I may have described some of the things you're going through. I may have not, but you're, you're feeling that, ti that tiredness. 
Come to Gilgal. Come to Jesus, and he will give you rest. All right. So I look at the next two experiences God will lead the people in. The renewal of the Passover and the appropriation of the land's produce. Let's pick up in Joshua chapter 5, verse 10. While the Israelites camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month. The day after Passover, they ate unleavened bread and roasted grain from the produce of the land. And the day after, they ate from the produce of the land. The manna ceased. Since there was no more manna for the Israelites, they ate from the crops of the land of Canaan that year. In Exodus 12, the children of Israel were finally released of their 400-year incarceration in Egypt. The Passover re-read points to Jesus, who was the ultimate Passover lamb. Here's how. Unleavened bread, bread baked without yeast, commemorates the hasty exit Israel made from Egypt there in Exodus 12. Unleavened bread also points to our call to be holy as God is holy. And fasting from unleavened bread reminds us to discipline ourselves and choose obedience. Our first fruits, our first fruits offering points to our acceptance by God since the offering uh, of Christ. Our first fruit offering points to our acceptance by God since the offering of Christ. The first fruits of the resurrection was accepted. Once they get into the promised land, God led the people to appropriate the land when the people saw the crops were ready for the harvest, just as God had promised in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Again, we're talking about a land that was just full of all the good stuff. Collard greens, carrots, black-eyed peas, lima beans, grain, and all that. Strawberries and, you know, I don't know. Cherries and apples and I don't know, all kinds of good stuff there. All of it now was readily available for a million people in order to celebrate the festivals of the Passover and unleavened bread. On the day after the Passover, the manna ceased and thus ended a 40 year miracle. Now, if the Passover reminded the Jews of the redemption of Egypt, from Egypt, the manna reminded them of the desire to go back to Egypt. They said in Exodus 16, 3, they complained would God, um, that God would, uh, they would have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the uh, flesh pots, and when we and when we did eat bread to the full, it was be- they felt it was better for them there than to eat this manna that came from God. God fed His people from heaven, the food of angels, it says in Psalm seventy-eight, and yet they still lusted for the food of Egypt. We're eating the food of angels, and yet they still lusted for the food of Egypt. God easily took his people out of Egypt, but it was difficult for him to take Egypt out of the people. Too many professed Christians contradict their professions by exhibiting an appetite for what belongs to their past life. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, If then you were raised with Christ, 
seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. So using the imagery from Joshua, this means you've crossed the river and are now in your inheritance. Don't look back and desire the things of Egypt or the wilderness. Let God feed you and satisfy you with the harvest of his inheritance. The thing about this image here is that the harvest is another image of death and resurrection. The seed is buried on the ground and what it dies. But from that death comes forth beauty and fruitfulness. Jesus applied this, applied to himself both the image of the manna in John chapter 6, verses 26 through 59, and the harvest in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 28. He did this. He said this in order to let us know that He is the nourishment upon which we must feed. Is He your bread of life? Is Jesus fulfilling you spiritually? Is that bread, and it should be, as a believer, you shouldn't want anything else but Jesus. He he alone will fill you and give you the nourishment that you need. Amazing. The resurrect, I mean the the Passover there and the appropriation of the land. All right. Let's read the last section in Joshua chapter 5 verse 11, or 13, I'm sorry, 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, Are you here for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face on the ground in worship and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did that. Experience four again. This is the the fourth experience that God led Israel to experience these three verses, we see God preparing Joshua, the nation's leader, to lead them, lead the people into battle at Jericho. Joshua leaves the camp at Gilgal and begins to survey the land. He had probably seen seen Jericho 40 years earlier when he and Caleb spied out the area. While he's there several miles from the fortress, he is approached by one with a drawn sword. So Joshua boldly asks him, and this is, again, this one has this sword drawn as in a very powerful position and he asked, Joshua boldly asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And what was the response again here? Neither, I have come as commander of the Lord's army. Joshua hears this divine presence say, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. This sounds familiar. Well, it's the same order Moses heard well over 40 years earlier at the back side of the, uh, the, back, uh, the back side of the desert there in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. 
And so what do we see Joshua doing? He begins to worship this divine presence. Now, I'll get to who that was in just a minute, but it must have been a great encouragement to Joshua to realize that he wasn't alone. There's a loneliness to leadership that can be disturbing and even depressing as you realize how much your decisions affect the lives of others. To be president of the United States is to be lonely, said Harry Truman. Very lonely at times of great decisions. And so Joshua must have been feeling some of that loneliness. God had promised to be with Joshua there in chapter 1, and the people had prayed that the Lord will be with him. There again in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. See, the enemy knew that God was with Israel, and Joshua had encouraged his people with this promise. So now, Joshua was experiencing the reality of that promise. I also appreciate the courage of Joshua as he confronted this stranger. For he wanted to know what side he was on. With Joshua, there was no compromise. You were either for the Lord and his people or against them. So when Joshua discovered this visitor was the Lord, he fell at his feet in worship and waited for his orders. In Christian ministry, great public victories are won in private as leaders submit to the Lord and receive their directions from Him. And that's what we do here in this church. That's what I ask, that's what I'm always asking the leaders here is that my will be done, that no one's will, but God's will be done with this church and that, again, we, they help, that they pray, the leaders will pray for me, the church will pray for me as we make decisions for this church because I know it affects, it may affect a lot of people. Again, we must submit to the Lord. Submit to Him and receive our directions from Him. It's doubtful that anyone there at the camp of Israel knew about the Israel's or the leader's meeting with the Lord, but that meeting made a difference between success and failure on the battlefield. The Chinese Bible teacher, Watchman Nee, wrote, Not until we take the place of a servant can he take his place as Lord. Not until we take the place of a servant can he take his place as Lord. In these verses, Joshua was also reminded that he was second in command. Every father and mother, pastor and Christian leader is second in command to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, we for, and when we forget this fact, we'll start to move towards defeat and failure. The Lord came to Joshua that day not just to help, not just to give a hand, to give advice. No, He came to lead. Without me, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, Without me, you can do nothing. Joshua was an experienced soldier who Moses had trained for leadership, yet that was no guarantee for success or of success. He needed the presence, Lord God. Again, just to be clear, who Joshua saw it wasn't an angelic being. Here we, counter, we encounter a theophany, theophany, 
the visible manifestation of God to humans, or a lot of people will say that it was the Christophany, the visible manifestation of Christ, the Son of God, to humans before his birth in Bethlehem. Either one isn't wrong. Both, again, are God. But let me share a few things here. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, John the Apostle falls at the feet of an angelic being, and the angelic being says to him, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. Worship God. However, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, John submits himself to the one who said, I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. So do you see the difference there? If this was an angelic being, that angelic being more than likely would have said, hey, you know what, don't do that. Don't worship me. Don't fall on your knees before me. Worship God alone. But we see that he, it, what, he didn't stop him. So again, that really points to Joshua recognizing that this was the Lord himself. This is Jesus, our Lord, who doesn't prohibit John there in those, chat, in those verses we read, but here now, Joshua, from assuming, assuming a posture of worship. So when Joshua met the Lord, he discovered that the battle was the Lord's, and he had already come, overcome the enemy. And so all Joshua had to do was listen to God's word and obey orders. And God would just do the rest. God had already given Jericho to Israel. All they had to do was step out by faith and claim the victory by obeying the Lord. In a meeting with a small group of missionaries in China, Hudson, uh, James Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Island Mission, now Overseas Mission Fellowship, reminded them that there were three ways to do God's work. One is to make the best plans we can and carry them out to the best of our ability or having carefully laid our plans and determined to carry them through, we may ask God to help us and to prosper us in connection with, with them. Yet another way of working is to begin with God, to ask His plans and to offer ourselves to Him to carry out His purposes. Again, one is to make the best plans we can and carry them out to the best of our ability. Or lay them out and determine to carry them through and ask God to help us as we, as we do them. Or we can just say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. What are your plans? I'm here and I will obey what you have to say, to carry out your orders. Church, the main lesson of this chapter is that we must be a spiritually prepared people if we're going to do the Lord's work successfully and glorify His name. Instead of rushing into battle, we must take time to be holy. We must consecrate ourselves at Gil Gilgal. Take time, my friends, to be holy. In a letter to his missionary friend, Reverend Daniel Edwards, the saintly Scottish preacher Robert Murray Cheyenne wrote, Remember, you are, God, you are God's sword, his instrument, I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name in great measure according to the purity and perfections of the instrument will be the success 
It is not great talents God blesses so much as a great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. That letter, written in 1840, that letter was written in 1840, but it's admonition to God's people. But it's an admonition to God's people today. All of us, all of you, who are born again believers, are His ministers, His servants, and you. We we want to be holy. We want to be holy instruments that He can use successfully. So as I summarize what we read here, in these three actions, circumcision, renewal of, uh, I'm sorry, four actions, renewal of Passover, and orientation of Joshua, their leader, we see three foreshadows of the divine. Circumcision represents when Jesus was cut off from the Father at Calvary because He was the sin bearer. There he was abandoned and cried out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? In the Passover, Jesus is our Passover lamb. John the Baptist declared in John chapter 1, verse 29, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't come to bring an offering. He is the offering. And then finally, my friends, the divine presence of Christ as the captain of the Lord's heavenly armies, armies means Christ has come to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He comes to take over. No wonder John said of history's finale, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of of our Lord and of His Christ. Church, we have a wonderful Savior in Jesus. No one, nothing will ever compare to what He's done and what He's given you. Glorify and praise Him every day, every moment. Understand that He wants you to be circumcised, have, have be circumcised in your heart. He doesn't want those. He wants the works to come out of that love that arises after you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, after you've been saved those works that are sincere. Sincere and holy. We have a leader. We don't have a Joshua, but we have Jesus. And He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Is He your King? Is He your Lord? Well, I want to give you an opportunity to ask Him to be the Lord of your life, to surrender your life to Him and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Only He can do that. Only He is the way to the Father. No one else, nothing else. So if you've reached the end of your rope, or even if you haven't and you now clearly see and understand that you need Jesus. I want to invite you to the cross where you can lay your sins before Him and ask Him to take it all away. To roll away the disgrace of that sin. To make you new. To make you a new person. A child of God. So wherever you're at, if you've never prayed before and you need, uh, you need some help to receive Jesus, 
want you to close your eyes and bow your head. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as, and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now, as I open my heart to you, Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and instruct me and draw me near to you in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Those of you watching, if you prayed that, please reach out to us. I want to help you in your next steps. Maybe help you find a church in your area where you'll be taught the Word of God. Um, and maybe you just pray with you. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, please fill out that section on our website. Or you can send us a message on YouTube or Facebook, and uh, we'll get back to you. But I want to just thank you for t joining us this Sunday. I uh, hope that you have a blessed rest of the day, that you have a blessed week, and that God, may God use you mightily wherever He has you, wherever He's placed you. Um, and, you know, just share Jesus whenever you can, not just with your words, but with your actions as well. Have a great Sunday. Have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.